Welcome to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel, and we're talking about the military in Hawaii today. And, and we have uh, a com Commander Scott Fritzell, Fr Nitzel, I'm sorry, uh, from the United States, United States Navy, and uh, Lieutenant Commander Simon Dent, am I right, from the Australian Navy. Welcome, you, you guys. Thanks, Jay. We're happy to be here. Good morning, Jay. So we're talking about RIMPAC. The title of our show is, um, gee, it's about RIMPAC. It's a uh, RIMPAC here in the Pacific, here in Hawaii right now. It's happening. Am I right, gentlemen? It's happening right now. It is ongoing right now. Uh, we're uh, a little over a week into the exercise, and we've got a little less than a week to go. But uh, ships are at sea right now, uh, operating as we speak. Yeah. And so um, there are, uh, let me tell you, let me sort of uh, tell you what I, what I read. There are 22 ships involved from something like nine countries, including, of course, the U.S. with the largest contingent, uh, I want to say seven or eight ships. Uh, Australia has four ships and uh, various other countries uh, have representative ships. There are 5,000 uh, men and women involved in this operation. And what I like most is, is RIMPAC as an acronym. You know, you'd think it was a sophisticated military and acronym. It's not, it's not an acronym that requires any long discussion. RIM stands for RIM. R-I-M, RIM is RIM. And, and, and PAC stands for Pacific. RIM of the Pacific. There you go. <laughs> I thought that was really fun. Um, so, you know, this has been going on for a long time. Uh, so, Scott, can you tell us, um, you know, what it is, why it is, where it is, and who, who generally participates? Sure. So, uh, as you mentioned, it's been going on for a while. First, uh, so next 50 years since we started, uh, and we extend uh, invitations to uh, our partners across the Pacific uh, who share our values uh, and who are interested in coming together uh, to, to build trust, uh, to build capability, uh, and to be ready to respond. Uh, we know there will be a crisis in the future. Uh, that could be a natural disaster. That could be a man-made. Uh, but we know a crisis will occur. And uh, bringing us together every two years here in Hawaii and in Southern California to develop that trust relationships means we are all better positioned uh, to respond when the crisis eventually occurs. Yeah, so this is a, a study not necessarily in, um, in weapon systems or in uh, equipment as much as it is in collaboration of human beings. Am I right? I think that's a, a fair statement. Certainly, we will uh, flex our combat systems uh, and, and the ships and submarines and aircraft. Uh, but, you know, we're building trust uh, and, and we're building the ability to operate together. Uh, we often talk about uh, the challenges, even for the countries where English is the primary language. Uh, we, we work through those challenges of, of our unique military uh, terminologies and lexicons to make sure that uh, we understand now when we train in uh, a calm time that we're ready when we go into the, the crisis time. Yeah, that's, well, that's really good. Wait, are you, where are you? Are you south or southwest of Oahu? Uh, so we're operating uh, around the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, a large portion of the uh, action happens to the south, uh, but we're also uh, engaging in use of the Pacific Missile Range Facility uh, to the uh, northwest of Kauai. Uh, and then we, uh, we operate uh, within our training ranges around the Hawaiian Islands. So I take it this is about exercises. Um, and you have a fleet out there all lined up uh, in the ocean, um, save four or five columns of ships, each one in this case of 22. So you figure if there's four columns, each one is roughly five ships in a row. Um, what do they do? What, what, what is an exercise for the purpose of RIMPAC? Yeah, so we, uh, we step through a, a, a lot of different types of events. Uh, we do, uh, we would call maneuvering and interoperability. It's close together, uh, talking to each other on the radio, making sure that uh, we can communicate smoothly. Uh, and then we move into a large number of uh, serialized events. Uh, we do air defense, surface warfare, air defense, anti-submarine warfare. Uh, and then we're also doing gunnery and live missile and torpedo firings. Uh, so we're getting across a, a large spectrum of uh, military activity uh, that allows each nation to participate and achieve their uh, training objectives here in the, in the operating area. So, so I expect some are stronger, some are not so strong, but they all, they all benefit by the collaboration and being involved in the, in the joint experience, am I right? Oh, absolutely. And one of the tenets of RIMPAC is inclusivity. Uh, we want our partner nations to come here uh, at whatever level of proficiency and platform they're able to bring because we all leave better if we operate together, if we cooperate uh, and continue to develop those relationships. 
Yeah, I think this is an example of diplomacy, isn't it? Military diplomacy, that is not a contradiction in terms. That is the way it's been for the past several decades. And uh, you're actually doing diplomacy with other countries, right? Sure, I think, that, I think that's a fair characterization. Uh, you know, we're building relationships, not just between the navies, but between the people. Uh, and by extension, I think that involves building relationships between the nations. Yeah, sort of like APCSS, the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies, which Dan and OA, you know, uh, organized way back a couple, three decades ago. Um, it's, it's all about uh, collaboration and it's all about building relationships. Yeah. So, uh, I, you know, I, I, think, uh, I think this is a great thing for the United States to do. And I want to go on record to say that I'm available to be a citizen observer uh, anytime you say, I, I'll, I'll go there and I'll follow all the rules and, and just sort of suck up the, the whole experience. You know? So, uh, Simon, uh, you know, they, you know uh, Scott said that they speak English uh, while, you know, uh, they have these exercises. Do you have any problem understanding the English? Um, there's in the exercise control cell where we are, they regularly turn around and say, can you interpret the Australian English for me? <laughs> And, and, and do they understand you? <laughs> I have learnt to adjust. Um, I've, I've been fortunate. I've been here since December 18. Um, and we still have... I'm sorry, what does that mean? <laughs> Only joking, right? So anyway, t tell me about Australia's role in this and how it feels about How important is, is this for Australia, which actually has, the, uh, has four ships here? Uh, as part of impact, uh, what does it mean to Australia? What does it mean to the Australian Navy? Um, it is very important. It was, um, and the overall, so RIMPAC allows the like-minded navies to strengthen relationships. And within Australia, it strengthens those relationships. Um, there are a few countries from the South, Southeast Asian area, um, and those are coming together um, and making capable military partners. And we operate in that area, uh, throughout the year in, in a number of exercises. Um, and over in Hawaii, it's one of the best exercise areas in the world to be able to do this. Why is that? It just, it allows for um, the Pacific Missile Range Facility where we can fire our, uh, our long range weapons. Um, HMAS Hobart and the upgraded Anzac class ships um, have fired weapons this rim pack. Um, it's just an opportunity that we don't necessarily have back in Australia. Um, and it's just a world-class facility. How, how do the Australians uh, feel about the United States in general these days? I mean, are they, are they uh, for example, are they generally aware of RIMPAC? Are they, are, are they generally uh, engaged, if you will, with the United States? Yeah, I believe they are. Um, RIMPAC is one of the largest exercises that Australia, the Australian Navy participates in. Um, all forces uh, participate, the Air Force and the Army both participate in, the, in, in RIMPAC, um, but they have other larger exercises, the RAF and the Army, uh, that they participate in. But the overall public have an awareness of what RIMPAC is, yes. So, uh, Simon, what is, what is your role vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, the, uh, the Australian contingent to the exercise? Uh, so my role is separate to the Australian contingent within RIMPAC. I'm the RIMPAC 2020 coordinator, and my role is to execute the two-year planning cycle. Um, I coordinate up to 30 nations, multiple US commands and units, and 29 working group leads over the seven planning events up through and during execution, which occupies my time. Uh, a Royal Australian Navy officer has held this role at the fleet in San Diego for over 20 years. Um, mm. It's a US Pacific fleet hosted but partner nation planned and executed. Um, and I feel very privileged to be serving in this role. Yeah, different years have had different leaders. In other words, one country will be a leader. Who's the leader this year? Is Australia the leader? Is the US the leader? Who is the leader? So the overall, uh, either the combined commander task force is always commander US third fleet. So subordinate commanders or component commanders um, do change throughout RIMPACs but the overall commander for RIMPAC will always be U.S. Third Fleet. Mm. So uh, Scott is, uh, Scott is the, the, what, the senior planner for RIMPAC for the United States Navy. Am I right about that, Scott? Yes, I'm um, senior planner, and then I also do the uh, specifics of the uh, surface ship planning. So you guys work together. I mean, uh, I, I, I assume you haven't just met now. Um, do you work together? Do you see each other in connection with RIMPAC? 
Who we do. So Simon and I work uh, in the same office. Uh, we uh, traveled to Hawaii on the same flight. Uh, we did our 14-day uh, quarantine in rooms next to each other. Uh, and when we work day-to-day uh, -day during RIMPAC execution, our desks are about eight and a half feet apart. Uh, so they're socially distanced, uh, but we, uh, we collaborate closely. Uh, and then uh, back home, we're also neighbors. Uh, we live about five minutes away from each other. Oh, is that right? So, when, uh, you know, uh, Scott, uh, you're um, uh, a commander, uh, and that's the United States Navy commander, and Simon is a lieutenant commander in, in, in the Australian Navy. And I don't know whether those are parallel or whether they serve the same, the same hierarchy as, as they would if you were both in the same Navy. But I just want to know is when you walk down the street together, who is on the right and who is on the left? I think it's it's often confused because neither one of us knows which side of the road is the right place and it goes on the sidewalk too. <laughs> it's a real problem when you deal with somebody from the Commonwealth. Eh? <laughs> and in the UK, it gets very complicated. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you for that answer. So, you know, I understand that the 22 ships that are involved in this operation are all operating at sea. The exercise is entirely at sea, as opposed to years past, every two years this happens. And for the most part in the years past, um, it was both on sea and land. Uh, why is it only at sea this year, Scott? I think, uh, you know, it, in, in the COVID-19 environment, uh, we looked at what options were available uh, and, and skipping RIMPAC simply was not a viable option. Uh, this is too important to our partners. This is too important to the Pacific as a whole. Uh, and so we wanted to execute. So we looked at how we could do that safely to protect the crews on also to protect the people of Hawaii. Yeah, fair uh, enough. And the only way we felt we could do that effectively uh, was to go and execute at sea. And I take it that the uh, men and women on the ships, at least the Navy ships, are all staying on the ships, 5,300 uh, and change of them. Uh, they don't come ashore, or do they come ashore for liberty after, after the, the exercise? Uh, no, so they're on the ships. Uh, the only piece of Hawaiian territory they will have seen in person would be the pier immediately adjacent to their ship. Uh, other than that, uh, they're on the ships. Uh, they get to look at the beautiful scenery, uh, but uh, don't get to partake in any hospitality this time. <laughs> that is really tragic, especially for those who haven't been here, you know, until now. Um, so and th that applies to all the ships of all the, whatever it is, seven or eight countries that are involved. Am I right? That's correct. And that, and that, that includes uh, Australia, so that the uh, Australian men and women, you have women in the Navy, right? In Australia, you're not just, you know, you, you're, 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 yeah, both. That's yeah. Commander Task Force. So one of the commanders out there of Task Force One, uh, Captain Philippa Hay. Hmm, good. So let me go to some questions that came in. <laughs> First question is, uh, with the tougher trade and human rights policy by the current American administration, aimed at the People's Republic of China. <clears throat> Excuse me, how, how will this, uh, how will this uh, change in American policy change the level of cooperation of the PRC in uh, RIMPAC this year? That's an easy one, but uh, uh, Scott, why don't you take that? Sure, so there's, uh, there's really no change uh, because China is not a participant in RIMPAC 2020. Uh, China is a uh, continued uh, behavior in the international realm is incompatible with the values of RIMPAC, uh, so they were not invited. Uh, that's a, a senior civilian leadership decision, uh, but uh, the values they share aren't what's uh, important in RIMPAC, so they were not invited and they do not have a participating role. Yeah, my understanding is uh, it was 20, uh, either 2016 or 2018, they were invited and then uninvited because of some shenanigans they were doing in the South China Sea. Uh, and since then, they haven't been invited back um, because the, sh the shenanigans haven't stopped. <laughs> so it's only fair. And, and that's only part of the shenanigans because they're not only uh, doing their thing in the South China Sea, they're doing their thing in Hong Kong and they're making moves on Taiwan and, and they have human rights problems that are greater today than they were uh, in any period in, over the past 10 or 20 years. Um, you know, uh, they're the Chinese... Um, activities in South China Sea, uh, th those activities uh, affect Australia, don't they? They do, they do. Um, there are a number, of, um, a number of trade routes that go through there and any of those activities that either prevent or um, disrupt any of those trade routes. It's, um, it's a concern for all, all global 
uh, nations, Australia being one of them, and we have a, a strong trade with China. Um, so it is a concern for Australia at this time. Yeah, understood. Uh, second question that was submitted. Uh, will Taiwan ever be invited to uh, RIMPAC? It isn't, it isn't in RIMPAC this year. I don't know if it was invited before, but would, would, would it ever be invited? Uh, uh, I guess that's yours, Scott. Sure. So uh, Taiwan is not participating this year. Uh, they were not invited. They have not been a participant in the past. Uh, and again, that's a, a senior civilian leadership decision. Uh, but I would tell you that uh, from a practical standpoint, to participate in RIMPAC, a country first needs to participate as an observer, uh, send personnel to, to watch the exercise, see how business is done, uh, and then prepare their forces for the two-year planning cycle. Uh, and Taiwan has also not done that yet. Uh, so to date, uh, it remains a, a civilian leadership decision to be made uh, but we're not uh, actively involved in the integration of Taiwan right now. Yeah. It must be interesting to live in, uh, in Asia now, uh, for that matter, in, in Australia, New Zealand. And New Zealand is represented. They have one ship involved in RIMPAC, right? Um, so uh, I, I just wonder, don't you think, um, Simon, that the, uh, that the, um, the, the, the tone, the atmosphere of ge geopolitics in uh, you've been in the Navy for a while, uh, has changed over the past, say, 10 years. Uh, and right now there are, what do we call it, threats and tensions that didn't exist 10 years ago. Am I right? And I think RIMPAC is a, is a great opportunity for the partner nations to come together. And as Commander Nitzel said earlier, it's these, uh, these exercises and specifically the events that happen during these exercises that allow the partner nations to communicate together, work together, and do those those inter interoperability exercises that allow the partner nations to um, be able to come together in a time of crisis, um, having already operated together. Yeah, uh, very important. Very important to the United States, very important to you, very important to the other members of, of RIMPAC. Let me reintroduce our guests. Uh, Lieutenant Commander Simon Dent from the Australian Navy, uh, Commander Scott Nitzel from the United States Navy. So the third question that was submitted is this. Describe the changing participation of New Zealand in RIMPAC. Uh, since they, they pulled out of the ANZUS Treaty, New Zealand has slowly increased its RIMPAC participation. And indeed, they're involved in the RIMPAC this year. There have been, and I'm adding this myself, there have been issues about uh, groups in, in New Zealand who oppose nuclear weapons. Um, but you know, what do you see for the future of that? Let me ask you, Simon, simply because you're geographically closer. Um, there, is a, there is an interest with um, New Zealand and, they, and I was speaking with their lead planner um, and they have an interest in participating in RIMPAC 2022 as well. Um, it, it, again, um, as a Southwest Pacific nation, like Australia, we have an interest of what happens in the Southwest Pacific and operating with Australia and some of those other nations is a perfect opportunity for that. I will hand to Commander Nitzel um, specifically because that is a US-New Zealand um, issue that when they didn't participate in RIMPAC many years ago. Yeah. Uh, Scott, what, what, would you add anything to that on be, you know, in, in connection with the U.S. Uh, view of it? I, I would just say that uh, we're, we're certainly happy to have New Zealand uh, here participating uh, with their ship, uh, the Manawanui, uh, one of their newest ships in the fleet uh, here. Uh, and actually under the command of a, a friend I made during RIMPAC 2018. So the, the relationship building Continues and also New Zealand uh, was our hosts for uh, the last in-person conference uh, before the COVID crisis uh, moved us to virtual planning. Uh, so they were fantastic hosts uh, and brought uh, the key leadership for Impact down to Wellington in February, uh, where we had our last in-person planning meeting. Yeah, Wellington's a beautiful place. On, on the other hand, so is Sydney, but my favorite place is Melbourne. We were there. My wife and I were there a couple of years ago, and we went to Tasmania too. By the way, we love Tasmania. <laughs> that is so uh, you know, I'm just I'm just wondering um, just about your careers, gentlemen. Just can I take a, a digression for a moment, uh, Scott? Why did you get into the Navy, and how has your career been in, in the years since? Uh, so it's interesting. Uh, I didn't really intend to join the military. I uh, went to a first year of uh, college. And then I got in contact with a Navy recruiter and ended up in the ROTC program in Missouri. Uh, and i uh, been in almost 20 years now. Been a surface warfare officer driving ships uh, the whole time. Uh, and I've had a, a fantastic career. I've been stationed here in Hawaii uh, for five years. Spent some time in Monterey, California, Newport, Rhode Island, San Diego. 
uh, done five deployments uh, and been fortunate enough to command a ship. So I would say uh, the Navy has probably treated me better than I deserve. Uh, and I have a very good career so far. <laughs> it sounds terrific. You're going to stay in longer than 20 then? I'll be in for a while longer. Uh, I am starting to think about uh, when, when retirement's going to come uh, because uh, obviously there's, there's life after the Navy. Uh, but for now, I'm very happy with what I do and uh, I love the people I work with and uh, what I get to, get to do and see every day. So is there any chance you would retire? I mean, as and when you do uh, in Hawaii, I mean, Hawaii has a huge Navy retirement community, retired officer community. And I wonder if you've ever entertained that thought. Oh, it's certainly a thought. Uh, my wife loves to scuba dive. Uh, so I don't think there would be any objections from her to a, uh, a residence here in Hawaii. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And then you can come back on the show over and over again, you know. Sure. <laughs> so, so Simon, um, you know, by the way, I have family in uh, in Britain, in the UK, by the same name, Dent. We, we might be related. Ooh, how do you right. like that? Um, but but let me ask you about your uh, career in the, in the Australian Navy. What's it been like? Why did you go in? How has it been? Um, so I left when I left school, I, I started an apprenticeship. Um, and I went through that and then I just wanted a change in life. Um, and I joined the Navy. Um, just past 17 years now, and um, and I've had a fantastic career. The Navy's taken me all around Australia, um, and I've deployed to the Middle East three times, it's, and obviously over to the US for this two-year posting. Um, I've had command of a patrol boat in Australia, uh, so it has been, and moving all around the world, seeing fantastic places and visiting, um, just builds relationships and friendships that you keep forever. Yeah, that's great. Um, how, how does the, the Australian Navy, I mean, you've dealt, you've dealt with the likes of uh, Scott Neitzel, so you can answer this. Uh, how does the Australian Navy differ from the American Navy? There must be cultural differences. Can you, can you talk about that for a minute? Um, yeah, I can. We, and we, we talk about this at, at work um, regularly. It's, we have um, similar issues, whether they be communications or ships at sea, any of those things, just on a much smaller scale. Um, the US Navy obviously has responsibilities all around the world um, on a much larger scale than we do, but um, they have personnel issues just as we do. Um, it's just on a little bit smaller scale for the Australians. Yeah, well, um, Scott, do you agree with him? And, and do you agree with those who feel that the American Naval officer is in general better looking? I think, uh... Comparing myself and Simon in terms of that, uh, I definitely have more hair. Uh, so whether that's a, a product of stress or not, uh, we'll, we'll leave, leave that up to uh, the viewer's judgment. Okay. This is, this is the part where we take a poll of our viewers and see what they say. Um, okay, back, back to the main theme here, though. Have you guys been out to sea on the RIMPAC? Have you, been, have you flown out to the ships while they were involved in the exercises? Have you, have you stood on the bridge and observed the moves, uh, Scott? Uh, I wish I could say that we had. Uh, unfortunately, with our, uh, our COVID mitigation protocols, uh, we're not uh, going out to the ships. Uh, and I'm a little disappointed uh, as a senior ship driver. Uh, everybody's out there shooting missiles, shooting guns, driving ships close together and flying helicopters. Uh, and I wish I was out there because uh, that's really what we like to do as professionals uh, and didn't get the opportunity this time. Well, as you said before, there's really nothing like being a ship driver. There's nothing like having a command. Uh, one, of our, one of our hosts here on Think Tech, who did a show just yesterday, uh, was a can in the Canadian Navy for a career. Um, and that's very similar <laughs> to the Australian and New Zealand Navy in some ways. Um, and, he, you know, he was a commander of a, of a number of submarines in the Canadian Navy. I didn't think they had submarines, but OK. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, I mean, the, the point is that once it gets into your blood, you, you never you're, you're different. Do you find that, Scott, that once you have a command, you're different? I think that's absolutely true. Uh, it is a unique experience, uh, both in the United States Navy in any Navy, but also in, in the human existence uh, to be responsible for so many people, uh, so much material, so much monetary value, uh, but then also the opportunity to really influence the outcomes. Uh, when you're the commander, you can say what's going to happen uh, and uh, you can get to see the improvement uh, that uh, those decisions make in your crew and in your ship. But I'd like to, uh, you know, I'd like to talk about the good old days in the 18th century. Those were the good old days. 
um, when you, you know you've got your you got your orders in a in a sealed envelope with wax on it, and you you had to go out to sea before you opened the envelope, and then you got out to sea and you had your instructions about where you're supposed to go, what you're going to do in your ship's mission, and there was no wireless, there was no way to communicate with the admiralty, and so the result was you were completely in charge. Now you're in constant constant connection with the, the command ashore. And they, they know what you're doing and they can change your direction, change your speed, change. They are in charge of you all the time. It's not the same thing. You, you can quote me on this. It's not the same thing as it was in the 18th century. Oh, for the good old days. Yeah. Thoughts about that? I think that's absolutely true. Uh, you know, we, we have a, a level of communication and connectivity right now that is uh, evolving every day. And, uh, I think COs still are empowered to make decisions, uh, and I still think that uh, good captains make a big difference, uh, but they certainly have a, a connection to their senior officers to, that they didn't have not even a centuries ago, not even 25 years ago. Uh, so there's definitely some reach back there. You know, one thing that happened is very interesting. In one of those skirmishes in Israel, <clears throat> they found uh, they found that the, the troops, the Israeli Defense Force, was, uh, was on social media. Um, and, and they were sending, you know, social media, Facebook messages to their, to their families and boyfriends, girlfriends, what have you. Um, and uh, see, the Israeli command was very upset about that because that would give away position and the like. Um, so they told them, stop that. Don't do that again. Finish. And so they don't do that anymore. And I, and I wonder on these ships, whether the crew on these ships, uh, the men and women who, who, who man these ships, let's see, that doesn't sound right. The men and women who man these ships, um, don't, do they have access to the internet? Um, can they send messages back to, you know, uh, Sydney, for example, uh, to their families? Or, or is, that, is that against the rules? Uh, Simon? No, no, they definitely do. They have um, <clears throat> email. Um, is something that is available to them all the time. And then they have a, um, an internet cafe where they can go and log on, depending on the, where they are and what the operational security is at the time. Um, they can log on to Facebook or um, it just depends on the opera operational security requirements at that time. But they can easily message or email. Um, and depending on where you are, you can uh, make telephone calls home as well. So it depends on the security issues at the moment, the, the situation, so to speak, at the moment. Yeah. Um, and what about the food? You know, Scott, they say the food is better on submarines, but it isn't so bad on the surface ships. Is this true? My experience has been the food is pretty good. Uh, you know, we got a lot of sailors who work hard to keep people fed. Uh, no one maybe has more impact on morale than the person who serves up the meals that you're going to eat three times every day. You know, but you don't, the Navy does not have, the American Navy does not have the, the, uh, the, meat, the meat pies, though. No. Uh, what, what about the Australian Navy? Do you have the meat pies? Yes, we certainly do. <laughs> so, viva la différence, eh? <clears throat> okay, well, I want to I get your, uh, your thoughts on what people should think. I mean, why, why should the men on the, on, the, on the street here in Hawaii care? about RIMPAC. Why should you care about the collaboration between uh, the United States and Australia and all the other seven or eight countries involved in RIMPAC? Um, doesn't affect them, does it? Uh, what would you say to them? Can you, can you leave a message for them, Scott, and tell them why they should care about this? Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, if we look at the, the Indo-Pacific region and this, this great ocean and the, the large amount of commerce that travels on it, everyone, uh, even the man on the street, benefits from that remaining a free and open uh, commons uh, that is used in accordance with international norms. Uh, and RIMPAC, especially maybe in RIMPAC 2020, where there is a global crisis going on and like-minded navies are still coming together uh, to pursue our common values, uh, should really reassure people uh, that even in a time of crisis, uh, we can help to ensure a free and open Indo-Pacific, and that is good for everyone, not just the man on the street in Honolulu, but uh, the man or woman on the street in any of the uh, nine partner nations that are here uh, it, it makes everyone's life better and uh, helps all of our economies. Wow. Um, so, Simon, I was going to ask you what you would add to that, but that was, you know, Scott really phrased that pretty well. Uh, what, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what you could add or I could add to that, but how, how, how do you see that from the Australian point of view? Why is it, what, what do you want the, the person on the street here in Honolulu to think about the participation of Australia and the other non-U.S. nations in RIMPAC? 
Um, well, I think 2020 is a little bit different. It's a little bit smaller, but we still had a, a safe and successful exercise. And I think the messages that we are trying to send each and every RIMPAC, and specifically this one, is to we are looking after the people of, of Hawaii, and that's why we didn't go ashore. And that's one of the key messages that we wish to pass throughout um, every series of RIMPAC, every event that we do here. Um, it is a beautiful part of the world. They've got environmentally sensitive areas. So we, we visit um, the state of Hawaii and we look after it and we want to pass that message and ensure that people are, understand that RIMPAC is here. Um, typically, they put a lot of money into the economy when people are staying down in Waikiki and, um, and enjoying the hospitality of everyone here. Um, and that's just unfortunate. That's something that we haven't been able to do this year. But that's, other than what Commander Nietzsche has said, that's about the only thing I could add to that, to his comment. Well done. Um, uh, Simon Dent, Lieutenant Commander in the Australian Navy. Uh, we, we, call, we can call you Mr. Am I right? That's the same as in the uh, US Navy, right? It's Mr., isn't it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and uh, Scott Nitzel, and we can call you commander in the United States Navy. Thank you so much, Scott. Thank you, Simon. It's, it's, it's great to have you guys on the show. Uh, and I say, welcome. thanks, Jay. We really enjoyed it. Aloha, aloha both. Enjoy the exercise. Enjoy the trip. Thank you.